Welcome everybody into the Big Ten Show. I am your host, Adam Carricker. I have a special guest with me today. I will bring him on here in a second. As always, I want to give a thank you and a shout out to our sponsor, Jacobson Seed. They're your healthy hybrid advantage. You can check them out at jacobsonseed.com. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am joined by a man who does a great job at the New York Post. He's a Wisconsin grad, Mr. Ryan Glasspiegel. How you doing, my friend? Good. Thank you for having me, Adam. I appreciate it. So I actually got a whole bunch of things to talk about here, including women's basketball. Why are they getting more viewers than men? Why are, you know, why is the nation kind of being captivated by certain things? But as I was logging on to the stream, you were talking about how you don't like college football teams playing basically tune-up games. And with the 12 team playoff, you think that'll be less and less. So I got a two part question. Number uh, one, if you're a big 10 and sec team, and you're like you're Michigan. You're staring down the barrel of Ohio State and Oregon and USC and going to Washington, which will be much tougher on the road. And then you're playing Texas in the non-conference. Are you really going to want to load up your non-conference schedule when you've got the SEC and Big Ten slates like some of these teams are going to be playing in the near future? I feel like on the margins, Adam, that the losses don't ding you, but the wins help you. What, so let's say you're, you know, that we're, we're not going to have the same type of heated arguments for who gets left out at 12 versus who gets left out in a 14 playoff, um, you know, where like there have been undefeated teams who get left out. But um, and, you know, when you're when you're looking at it and you're evaluating a Michigan, like, let's say it's a down year for them or whatever and you're evaluating them versus maybe like LSU or something for that 12th playoff spot, if they beat a strong out-of-conference team early in the year, that's going to be a feather in their cap in the argument. And so I think that the you know we all want as many interesting games as possible the season is only 3 months long they only play you know 11 or 12 games it's just such a waste of time to bring everyone into a 90,000 person stadium to see them beat up on like a division like two team and so you just more good matchups that you like you know you set up on your calendar as I'm going to make sure that when this day comes up, there's nothing going on there. Um, I just think that that benefits everybody involved. So a follow-up question, then I'll get to my original second question. So if you're playing a bunch more of these big name type teams and you got more of these big games, does that kind of value each? There's only a certain amount of importance that can be had. Just because there's more of something doesn't mean it becomes more important. We can print more money, but the value of money of each particular dollar goes down, so to speak. So does that kind of devalue each big matchup and each big game that we could potentially have then? There's such a scarcity in college football where, you know, we're talking about a super league, but if you talk, if you look at like the upper echelon, there's what, like 15 or 20 teams that really matter year in and year out. The more that they're playing each other, the better. I really don't see any way that it gets devalued when they're, you know, it's not like college basketball where um, there could be, you know, a hundred different teams that you're really keeping track of. It's, it's really the same programs year after year that are in the mix at the top and the more time they spend playing each other, I think the better. So before you came on, I was talking um, with your producer about the um, w Wisconsin versus Alabama on September 14th at Camp Randall. And I was saying, I feel like that game is going to be the litmus test on the Luke Fickle era. Like, I'm not saying they have to win, but they cannot just be totally outclassed by an Alabama team that no longer has Saban and no longer has God knows what percentage of their starters coming back. And, you know, they got to at least keep that close and ideally win for me to have confidence in the fickle era. I mean, you're, you're like this, she was saying with uh, Matt rule where, you know, you're on the upswing, but wouldn't you feel pretty good if you had, you know, an early September matchup to say like, okay, this is where I think we are as a program. 
Well, you're talking to a guy whose team is probably going to be starting a true freshman. So we got we got Colorado game two. Outside of that, we got a seven game. We should win six of these first seven games, if not seven. If we don't win five, there's, there, that's not going to be great. So for me, it, it depends. In Wisconsin spot, you have a, a year two coach, but you've got more veteran players, especially at particular positions. I actually am very intrigued by that Wisconsin Alabama game. I'm intrigued because there's so many question marks around Alabama right now. I'm intrigued because it's in Wisconsin. I, I I'd love it if it was in November, December, but you know we don't get to have everything well, we want. We're gonna get that finally in the playoffs. We are. Well, that's true. Going to get these SEC teams um, coming up to Ann Arbor and Columbus and God forbid Lincoln and Madison and playing in the cold because I have always maintained that they're going to lose those games when they happen. And now we finally are going to get to see it with these yeah. first round games on campus. Although, you know, with the top four getting a bye, it's not going to be the same type of, you know, they're not going to be playing usually like Michigan and Ann Arbor, but we can hope. So, you know, Michigan, the five seat versus a uh, 12 seat LSU, I, I you know, the, the weather is going to be a factor. So that is something that I've longed for since I was a kid watching the, the big eight go down to the Orange Bowl every year and have to play a Miami team half the time on their home field, but a Florida team in Florida or the big 10 teams. I mean, there was a long a lot of games in a row where the Big Ten lost the Rose Bowl, even though top to bottom they were a better conference because it was played in Pac-10 weather at the time, and those teams have speed. Their top-end teams were always really good. The top to bottom wasn't always great. And so I have longed for a long time for warm-weather teams to get out of their little bubble and come play up north in the cold. I've always longed for that, so I'm with you on that. I think when it comes back to Wisconsin-Alabama, I think that game's especially intriguing to me because it's going to matter to f both fan bases a lot. Now, from Wisconsin's perspective, maybe we don't have to win the game, but we got to be competitive and we got to be in it. From Alabama's perspective, if, God forbid, they get blown out, uh, they might uh, riot. But if they yeah. lose at all, they're going to riot just based on their expectations. It's two teams with a lot of question marks, yet high expectations at the same time, especially if you're an Alabama fan. Does Wisconsin have high expectations? I don't know about I, that. I think under Luke Fickle, they're going to kind of raise year after year. When I say high expectations, I mean relative I, to the I, program. I expectations going well, for Nebraska, year, like high God. expectations would be eight wins. For uh, Wisconsin, high expectations would be 10-11, getting to the playoff. Yeah. For Alabama, it's national championship. I meant relative to the program. That's all I was saying. So I'm especially intrigued by that as well so my last question and then we'll get to the women's college basketball and anything else we want to chat about should because if we're wanting big time non-conference games and then they got these difficult conference slates now especially the big two okay should there be preseason games much like the nfl in college football i think that they these cupcake games kind of are preseason games like they're still gonna have one or two of them i just don't want there to be you know three four cupcake games I got gotcha. you. Uh, I do think the preseason would be a good idea. You know, week zero is was not a thing even like what four years ago, mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden, you know, it's crept into August before Labor Day weekend, and we've got mm -hmm. you know what six games or something on week zero. So I could see week zero's presence growing. So why well, I, I love week zero if, if you're a team that's doing it because you get a primetime national televised game when you otherwise might not. And then a lot of these teams get an extra bye week. So why would you not do it? It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So women's college basketball. So I'm going to read off a few things here. All right. And you're probably aware of most of these. All right. But the most watched women's college basketball game on record since 1992 is a national championship game. 18.7 million viewers. All right. The viewership was up 89%. From a year ago in 2023, 285%, okay, from 2022, okay, from two most from the two most recent women's national title games, peaked at 24 million viewers at one point during the game. It's the most watched basketball game, men's or women's, college or pro, college or pro, since 2019. And excluding football, the Olympics, it's the most watched sporting event since 2019 and it had four million more viewers than the men's national championship game on monday night why are people so much more interested in women's college basketball first than they've ever been and 
I don't want to say more than men's, but the numbers, at least for the championship game, that indicate they were more interested yeah, yeah, in the, the women's championship than the men's, the whole final four. Why is that? I mean, it's two words, Caitlin Clark. She is like a singular dynamo. She's like a combination of Tiger Woods and Steph Curry. She's Tiger in the sense that she alone brought all of these extra viewers into the tent that wouldn't have otherwise been there. And she's Steph Curry in the sense that she is, you know, scoring at will with deep shots over giants. Like her, her body doesn't look like the, you know, um, Camilla Cardoso, for example. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you can put yourself in the shoes of a Steph Curry or a Caitlin Clark, even yet. Yeah, I know Curry's dad was an NBA player, but he still had to scratch and claw for everywhere that he got. And it's like, okay, these people spent just years and years and years in the gym developing these handles and this jump shot. And they're both also excellent passers. And it seems much more attainable than just like, you know, being born Shaquille O'Neal. And mm -hmm. not, it's not to say he didn't have to work hard or anything, but it just, it's a lot more relatable when um, it's people who aren't behemoths that are accomplishing this. And then as far as like why it's been bigger than the men's game, um, you know, the best men's players who are Caitlin Clark's age been in the NBA for two or three years now. Like imagine an NCAA tournament that had Wemby and Brandon Miller in it, and they'd be, you know, freshmen and sophomores right now. So um, the, like, you know, Wemby in three years, that's what, when you get Caitlin Clark. And so it, it's like the, they've, they've, there's, it's like a high level of gameplay and there's familiarity because, you know, South Carolina is 108 or something in three over the last three years. You know, Don Staley's going to be there. You know that um, Caitlin Clark and Iowa are going to be there. You know, um, Kim Mulkey and Angel Reese um, and Haley Van Lith and Flau J. Johnson at LSU are going to be there. You know, Gina Oriema and Paige Beckers are going to be there. They, these teams aren't getting knocked out in the early rounds and the players and coaches are institutions. Almost all of like the big name college basketball coaches have also left in the last several years. We've lost coach K we've lost Roy Williams. Rick Pitino is still kicking around, but he's not at a program that this year was in the tournament. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a big star power familiarity with the women's college game. That isn't the case with men's right now. I, I agree. Um, it's about star power. It's about name recognition. It's about brand recognition to a degree, but it's about star power and name recognition. Um, it's interesting. Kim Mulkey is already entertaining and talked about a lot. And then the whole post article and her addressing that at the press conference. And you got the whole Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark. That Elite Eight game was phenomenal to watch from an entertainment, entertainment standpoint. Iowa was clearly the better team on that day. But yeah, it's about star power and name recognition. And so... I think when it comes to women's basketball, what happened between Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese National Championship game last year was the best thing to ever happen to women's basketball because it brought so much attention and then everyone came back and everyone, all the fans were like, we know that, we know that situation, we know those people and boom, it was huge for women's basketball. Yeah, I mean, look at the gauntlet that they had from the Elite Eight to the finals. They played... Um, LSU in a rematch. Then they mm -hmm. played Gino Oriema, who's either the top or second most decorated women's college basketball coach of all time with like all the pedigree of UConn plus Paige Beckers, who, by the way, got recruited there over Caitlin Clark. Mm -hmm. yep. And then you've got a rematch with South Carolina and I was the only team that's beaten them in the last two years. And so it's just a gauntlet of you know narratives that are very easy for a casual fan to um you know latch on to all right so a lot of people have a lot of thoughts about caitlin clark and certain thoughts tend to get more publicity than others the ones that are going to be more eye-catching and they don't always tend to be the most positive ones and i'm referring to some <laughs> ladies who are either currently in the wnba or have been in the wnba 
So I'm very curious what it's going. I, I think Caitlin's going to step on the court, rookie or not, and be one of the best players in the WNBA. Okay, if not the best, relatively quickly. But there seems to be a lot of doubt about that. There seems to be a lot of ladies who are like, it's going to be welcome to the WNBA. You're playing with grown women now type deal. How do you foresee? I think down the road, Caitlin's going to be very, very good. But her first year or two, how do you think that's going to go? You know, it's she's going to bring a lot of attention to it. And there's going to be hyper vigilance on whether she is perceived to be succeeding or failing but adam here's like an interesting number i looked this up you mentioned that over 18 million people watched this finals game against south carolina the wnba finals last year averaged in the 700,000 range across the series so this is you know 25 times greater audience than the wnba finals average you know the wnba finals it's weird they put games like on ESPN2 right up against the Sunday NFL afternoon slate, which is like the last place you want to put mm -hmm. any meaningful athletic competition. And so it I don't want to say it's like jealousy, but she's going to bring a lot of new attention to this league. And I think there's a lot of stakeholders in the past pro of professional women's basketball who are like, hey, I was very good. Why is everybody paying attention to her when I was competing in relative obscurity? And so then it just becomes like, you know, they psych themselves into, oh, well, yeah, we'll show her. She's not going to be good. She's going to face not just like a lot of media pressure, but the, these WNBA players are going to send a message to her physically. And the way in the last couple rounds that these teams were playing her defensively and just doing everything in their power to prevent her from getting the ball, that's going to be the case with even bigger people just knocking her ass to the floor. And... And, you know, in that South Carolina game, that's like part of like why you like her is she gets knocked down. Like people set big screens and, you know, send her to the court and she does just gets up and keeps it moving and might just nail a 30 foot three in your face the next time down the floor. And, you know, the, it used to be like that with Jordan when we were kids where mm -hmm. they would knock him down and it would just like motivate him even more. And so we're going to have to like see how she responds to that. The bad boy Pistons, they had the Jordan rules, and it was all about basically just beating the crap out of him as much as they could within basketball rules, kind of. Sort of yeah. within basketball rules, but outside the lines for sure. Jordan responded by getting in the weight room, and he responded by being better. And I'm, Caitlin, I'm curious to see how Caitlin's going to respond because I think you're 100% right. I think she should preemptively. I'm not saying she's scrawny or anything, but get in that weight room preemptively, just yeah, knowing what's coming. starts in like – a month and a half it's not like she has much time to bulk up well i'm saying take some time off but you can also do things throughout the season because a lot of people will just take time off throughout the season from working out and that's when you'll get your biggest relapse so well, if like, you can at least maintain what you've got and then build throughout the off season that'll help a lot it's interesting because i think you're 100 percent right when you talk about the jealousy and everything that you laid out like hey i was a really good player i didn't get any of this pub etc 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 okay i will never forget my, I, I grew up, if I lost at Yahtzee, the, <laughs> everything was going flying. If I lost at Sorry, I was throwing the board. Like, I was a really bad sport as a kid, okay? Kind of better now. I, I like to say I'm mature just a smidge. But my rookie year with the Rams, we have a bye week, and I go into the facility, and I'm just going to work out. Um, no, no, not, not the bye week. Um, going into week one. It was going into week one. It was the last preseason game going into week one. And none of the starters were going to play except for me because rookies need to get as much experience as you can. So Steven Jackson, our running back, okay, was not going to play. So I'm walking through the weight room. And he's on the treadmill. And I know for a fact that he's going to be entering a contract dispute the next year. And I think it was Ladanian Tomlinson at the time. I could be wrong about this, uh, but just got a giant contract, whoever the running back was. Yeah. And I remember asking him and expecting him to be pissed out of the competitive thing like i'm the better running back i should be making the more like that type of deal he goes i couldn't be happier he goes i couldn't be happier because one year from now 
I have that contract to help me get more money on my contract. And that was the first time I ever looked at it like that. My point is the WNBA players might want to just keep in the back of their minds, you're going to get way more eyeballs, which means way yeah. more revenue, which means mo way more potential money in your pocket down the road, thanks to Angel Reese, Caitlin Clark, et cetera. So that's something they might just want to keep in mind real quick. All right, one more women's basketball question because Caitlin's gone, Angel's gone. Uh, you can let me know. I don't, I don't know if Paige Beckers is gone or not. Obviously, no, Kim Mulkey's coming, coming back. back. She's coming back. Yeah. But they're losing a lot of star power. How do they keep this going going forward? Well, they've got uh, Juju Watkins coming up, and then there's a player at Notre Dame whose name is escaping me now who's also really good. Uh, but, like, you know, Juju Wat like the Big Ten – did this TV deal with um, NBC, Fox, and CBS, as you know. And mm -hmm. it, it's qu clearly like it's mainly a football deal. But all of a sudden now, Adam, like women's volleyball has come up at um, – it was it's Hannah Hidalgo at Notre Dame, um, Lindsay's telling us. And yeah. thank you, so, Lindsay. Um, the like, you know, the all of a sudden women's volleyball is a big part of this TV deal. Mm -hmm. Then they get Caitlin Clark, and that goes straight into Juju Watkins at like USC. They had no idea that women's basketball was going to be like a relevant part of USC joining the conference, and now she's going to be the next big thing for the next three years. And so look, is it going to get 18 million next year? No, I think that Caitlin Clark was a singular talent. I don't know that they're going to outdraw the men's game in the final four again next year either, but I think that we've like had a rising tide that's lifted the baseline of where the boat is going to be. And like, once you start getting into the sweet 16 elite eight and final four, these women's basketball matchups are going to be appointment TV. And then it's also going to be, you know, you hope that USC and UConn schedule a home and home. And you hope that Notre Dame is in the mix with these schools and yeah, you know, South Carolina. Yeah. They're losing um, stars, but it doesn't seem like they're going to be going anywhere. And so, yeah, it's not going to be the same as this year. This year is an anomaly, but um, it, it's going to be a point of emphasis in the conversation this time of year for the foreseeable future. All right. Two more questions. Appreciate your time. Your time. Appreciate you joining me today. Zach Eady. All right. The <laughs> I'm, I'll say a giant because I've been called a giant several times in my life, but he dwarfs me. I'm six, six. He's seven, four. <laughs> Zach Eady. All right. The seven foot four Canadian attending Purdue. He's legally unable to make money off NIL deals that take place in the U.S. Now, there are some exceptions. He can make money off NIL deals outside of the country and also off his jersey sales. The answer seems pretty obvious to me, but I'm going to ask you, do these laws and rules need to be changed? Yeah, obviously. Yeah. I mean, we want to be hosting the best talent in the world. Although, you know, the NBA has declined in popularity, and there's been a lot of reasons for it. But one of them is that all of the rising stars are foreign born. I mean, uh, other than John Morant, um, who's been in trouble. I mean, look at it. It's like Giannis, Luka Doncic, Victor Weminyama, mm -hmm. um, on and on, like Nikola Jokic, on and on down the list. The best players are not um, born in America. And it's a weird thing, like, but Americans prefer to watch Americans play sports. And yep. I think that's a, been a big factor in football, just, you know, not only maintaining its popularity over the last 30 years as content has become more and more and more fragmented, but it's like taken away market share from the other sports. And I, I think that's a big factor in it. So I think you make a great point. The other thing. First of all, the one and done rule in college basketball is ridiculous. It's a joke, but it, I think it's hurting college basketball for reasons we pointed out earlier. A lot of their oh, yeah. stars are no longer in college basketball, which is hurting co college basketball. But I could argue it's hurting the NBA because there aren't a whole lot of college basketball players right now that go to the NBA as ready-made stars like they used to. So the NBA isn't receiving as many ready-made stars, and then a lot of the stars are from foreign countries, not, not U the U.S., so to speak. 
So for me, I think they got to change that rule back to two years, which it used to be. It would benefit college basketball, which then ultimately benefits the NBA, just like college football. They could easily change it to two years. I mean, Maurice Claret, you think about Mike Williams, the, the USC yeah. wide receiver back in the day, both tried to go early. They easily could have. It helps college football. Ultimately, it helps the NFL because they're getting household names right out the gate, which is why the NFL draft is much watched TV. And half the time, I don't know when Major League Baseball or the NBA draft is because I'm not that vested in the names. So, all right, I was told, you got to go in about four minutes, but I've been told yeah. that I should ask you about WrestleMania. All right, so I'm gonna let I'm just gonna let you answer that however you want. What are your thoughts on WrestleMania? Um, I was in a minority because I I wanted Roman Reigns to win. I've really been enjoying this bloodline angle over the last few years. Um, I they they threw the the fans a bone with with writing Cody to finish his story. I I really don't know where they're going to go from here. It's going to be fascinating to see who steps up to challenge Cody and then like kind of what Roman Reigns' path back to the championship picture is going to look like. I want to go back though to what you were saying about the two and done. Um, the NBA and college basketball compete against each other in the same viewership windows mm -hmm. in a way that the NFL and college football have like kind of just divvied up the nights of the week where college football gets Friday and Saturday and NFL gets the rest. Um, and so I think the NBA and college basketball would need to come together and figure out, okay, this is your night. This is my night in order mm -hmm. for the NBA to agree to that. But yes, to your point, I do think that it would benefit both of them. What did you think about WrestleMania? I thought it was great. Uh, I thought it was the most entertaining main event I've seen in a long time, maybe the most fun I've had. So I am a, a guy who's watched pro wrestling my entire life. The, the Triple H era's champion made me, I want to puke. I wanted to quit watching. <laughs> um, whether you like Triple H or not, I just thought it was the same thing, evolution, beating up everybody at the end of Raw every week. And there's been a long time. I've never been a John Cena guy. I recognize how talented he is. Part of it's the role he was asked to play, get the F out, going from WWF to WWE, doing his job. But I've, I just, there was about 10, 15 years where I'm like, I'm watching this out of loyalty. I know wrestling's cyclical, and I'm waiting for it to be good again. It's finally good again, and it's entertaining and fun. And yes, John Cena was a part of that main event. So I popped when he came out. Uh, I think Stone Cold was supposed to be out there, but I heard he got sick the day of. But hey, if you're going to give us the Undertaker at the end, that works too. Um, yeah, I I don't know whether he got sick or they um, didn't come up with a big enough check. Uh, it that takes too, a lot maybe. to get him off of that ranch in Texas. Um, the yeah, it, it's I I actually had a weird inkling that the Undertaker was going to show up, and I like wore my Undertaker shirt that day. I couldn't go this year unfortunately i went last year but um this is like my wife's first day back from work from maternity leave this monday and i just could not leave her alone with three kids five and under at 5 a.m because i congrats had by the way yet. congrats <laughs> thank you um but i yeah i mean where it goes from here is going to be very very interesting and i guess you know that's why we watch so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you get the final word in, but my final thought, the reason I thought Stone Cold was when The Rock was beating the crap in the parking lot out of Cody Rhodes with the Mama Rhodes belt on the truck. And this was pointed out by a lot of people. It was Cena and it was Austin. And that's not no normally who's on the truck. But then the day of WrestleMania 2, Triple H treats, tweets out at 316, okay, something about ready for <laughs> WrestleMania night 2, etc. But anyways, you got any final thoughts for, before you get out of here? Uh, no, I just want to reiterate that Wisconsin better not get embarrassed by <laughs> Alabama on yep. September 14th. I'm five months away. I'm already thinking about that. As a Big Ten guy, I am right there with you, my friend. All right, Ryan, thank you for joining me today. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to this on the radio, we'll be right back. If you're listening to it on podcast platforms, I'm going to be doing part two of the show here shortly. Go check it out. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Welcome back, everybody, to the Big Ten Show. If you missed part one of this show or the first part of this radio show broadcast, it's also put out on the podcast platforms. Go back and check it out. We talked about Wisconsin versus Alabama. Why 
women's college basketball, at least at the moment, has overtaken men's college basketball and it's kind of not close. How do the women maintain it? What can the men do to kind of make a little bit of a comeback? Okay. Hint, hint, hint. The one and done rule is really dumb. It's hurting the NBA and college basketball. But now, ladies and gentlemen, some of you may or you may not know, but I grew up a pro wrestling fan. My favorite wrestler as a kid was the Ultimate Warrior, not Hogan. My favorite wrestler as I grew up, I got a little bit older, was Goldberg, 1A, The Rock, 1B. Now, I'll be honest with you, when The Rock and Goldberg went head-to-head at Backlash all those years ago, I know Goldberg won the match, and Goldberg's actually a friend of mine. I've never met The Rock. The Rock was highly entertaining in that match, and he, he almost flipped, made me flip Goldberg and The Rock. It was really close. The, the Rock's last run, and this is crazy to say, I know it's not day in and day out for months and years like he did in the past. One of my favorite runs that he's had of all time, and his new entrance is phenomenal. He comes across like an absolute star. There are people who are stars that don't come across like stars. There are people who come across like stars who are not stars. This guy is a star who comes across like a star. Dwayne The Rock Johnson, I'm talking about. All right, WrestleMania. The Super Bowl of pro wrestling. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, before I forget, shout out to our sponsors, the Jacobson Seed Company. They're your healthy hybrid advantage. All right, farmers, we not only hopefully provide you phenomenal Big Ten content, and in this case, pro wrestling uh, fandom, so to speak, but Jacobson Seed will take care of all your seed needs. Your healthy hybrid advantage, check them them out at jacobsonseed.com. All right, I got three parts here. Part one just simply says The Rock. Number two is Roman Reigns and some of the greatest title runs of all time. I'm going to go through those fairly quickly because number three is Cody Rhodes, his story, and the WrestleMania main event, all the cameos, and why this was probably my favorite WrestleMania, at least night two. Night one was eh, night two, my favorite night of WrestleMania of all time. All right, let's talk about The Rock. The most followed American male, and maybe, maybe the biggest star on planet Earth, definitely in the conversation if he's not. So The Rock, he he, he, he almost got fired from the WWE all those years ago. Had a knee injury, was getting booed out the building, almost got fired. He said, Vince, let me be a bad guy. Let me tell the fans how much they absolutely suck. And he did. And then the fans went from chanting, die, Rocky, die, to he became the people's champion. And then he won the title. And then he's flipped back and forth from being a bad guy to a good guy more often than a pancake. But he does it so great every single time. The Rock comes back. It's supposed to be Roman Reigns and The Rock at WrestleMania. The biggest star in the WWE right now and possibly the biggest star on planet Earth. Oh, by the way, they're also cousins. Now, a little bit about Roman Reigns. If you didn't know, he just broke Hulk Hogan's record, main eventing nine different nights of WrestleMania, his ninth WrestleMania main event, which breaks Hulk Hogan's record of eight. Okay. Now, The other thing I love about Roman, this was a dude that seven years ago, after he beat The Undertaker, one of two guys to ever beat The Undertaker at WrestleMania, seven years ago, he came out that next next night on Monday Night Raw, and the fans were chanting, F-U Roman. They weren't using the letters. They were saying the words, but it was F-U Roman, and it was resoundingly loud. Seven years later. Now, in the meantime, this guy has had to take a significant amount of time off because he had to battle leukemia again. Then he comes back and has the greatest championship reign, unquestionably, of the modern WWE era, the past 25 years. Okay, that's back to when Stone Cold when it is, was in his heyday, and that's back to when The Rock had his initial great run, but unquestionably of the last quarter century. He held the title for 1,316 days. Now, this is a former all-ACC Defensive tackle, I might add, Roman Reigns. Just like Goldberg was an all-SEC defensive tackle as well. I almost said in, but tackle. The Rock played at the U, won a national title in 1991. If you're a Nebraska fan, there is film of him getting pancaked 
in that 1995 Orange Bowl, though, and him running off the field and not looking too hot. Just FYI, if you want to look that up on the tube of you, the YouTube. All right. Now, I actually had the distinct honor on a, four, on, a, on a show I used to have called Fourth and Pain. I don't know, 10, 15 years ago when I, we were in D.C. We actually aired on 106.7 The Fan, so yes, we were legit. Roman Reigns came on. He was part of the Shield. It was him, Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose. And I remember, first of all, he remembered who I was because he was drafted a year after I was. And I was like, holy crap, Roman Reigns knows who I am. All right. I almost feel important. The other thing that rem- I remember from that interview and I remember him saying, someday I want to be the guy. Man, how prophetic did that turn out to be? All right. Roman Reigns. We just compare longest WWE title runs to what he did all time, 1,316 days. That's fourth longest all time. Hulk Hogan, the third longest championship run of all time, 1,474 days. If you're not a diehard wrestling fan, you may not recognize these first two names. That's okay. Bob Backlund, 2,135 days. Think about how many years that freaking is. And then Bruno San Martino, 2,803 days. That's like almost a decade, ladies and gentlemen. All right, Bruno San Martino is also fifth on this list for longest championship reigns of all time, 1,237 days. All right, and then you look at the rest of the top 10. Actually, Roman Reigns, 735 days. It was number seven. Number eight, Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar. 503 days. Hulk Hogan's on here again, 469 days, the ninth longest. And then CM Punk, Mr. Pipe Pipe Bomb, Phil Brooks himself, number 10, 434 days. Now, I was intrigued by this because nobody ever talks about length of championship reigns outside of Roman Reigns very often anyways. It's always most all-time championships. So I looked up the top 10 wrestlers with the most all-time championships. Ric Flair. Woo! All right. And John Cena tied with 16. Now, Ric Flair will tell you his number is actually 24. How the WWE got 16 is not really clear to him. Okay, but he's talked about all the times a 16-time champ. John Cena, 16-time champ. Triple H, 14. Randy Orton ties Triple H with 14 world titles as well. All right, Hulk Hogan, 12 times. Now, I know... Some people think his legacy has been tarnished, but that's a topic for another day. What he did in the wrestling industry is, is undeniable. Edge, a.k.a. Adam Copeland, 11-time world champ. Brock Lesnar, The Rock, and Sting all tied 7th, 8th, and ninth with 10 world championships in their history. Vern Gagne, who has trained a plethora of WWE Hall of Famers, 10-time world champ. All right. Now, before I get to the next thing, it was interesting. I was like, man, I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of great wrestlers. And, and, and I did not write down every single name. Okay. Some of the ones that came off the top of my head was Hulk Hogan. And actually that day we met his daughter, Brooke. My, my son, Jacob, was like two at the time. That's how long ago this was. He's 14 now. A Goldberg, obviously a good friend of mine. Kurt Angle, AJ Styles, John Cena. By the way, I saw that picture the other day. And it was me, John Cena, and Angie, my wife. Hey, John. I didn't like where that hand placement was. And every time I see that picture, I think the same thing. Nobody might be able to see you, but I could see where that hand was. It was on the back, but it was on the borderline, my friend. All right. I digress. The Miz, who, by the way, wanted to argue NFL football with me, so that was asinine. Okay, CM Punk, kind of. It was at a house show in D.C. We got to go backstage. Uh, I think we actually met Kane that night, too. I could be wrong. I was so tired that night. But CM Punk was in the midst of his 434-day title reign, the 10th longest title reign that I just referenced a few minutes ago. He walked by us, and I wanted to say hi, but he looked pissed. So when I say I met him, uh, we walked by each other, and he looked really mad about something. All right. Uh, There's a bunch of other guys as well. I I, I didn't want to list everyone out. Those are just the ones that kind of popped into my head. All right. The main event of WrestleMania, the story, was Cody Rhodes the son of the great American dream, Dusty Rhodes, who was the son of a plumber. His son, Cody Rhodes, the American nightmare. He had a two-year story building up to this main event, the WrestleMania. He won the Royal Rumble two years in a row, which meant last year he was in the main event against Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns is part of a faction with his legit family members and cousins, the Usos, Jimmy and Jay. Jay's now out of the faction known as the Bloodline. But the twins, the Uso twins' younger brother, Solo Sokoa, is also in the bloodline faction. Solo interferes and costs Cody Rhodes finishing his story in the WWE Undisputed Universal Heavyweight Championship a year ago. That's a mouthful. But Cody Rhodes comes back. He wins the 
Royal Rumble again. If you win the Royal Rumble, you defeat 30 other men and throw, I'm sorry, 29 other men, and you throw 29 other men over the top rope, well, maybe you don't do it all, but you're the last one standing. He earned the right to be in the main event of WrestleMania again. The first guy to win back-to-back -back Royal Rumble since Stone Cold did it in the early 2000s. Now, enter The Rock. Cody Rhodes' whole story was around winning this world championship that his dad had never won, that no Rhodes had ever won, that this wrestling family of royalty, the Rhodes family, had never won. His brother Dusty, I'm sorry, Dustin, and if you remember his character of seven for about a, one WCW, if you are getting that reference, you are a pro wrestling fan, Dustin Rhodes was known as seven for one WCW and Nitro, and it, didn't, it did not go past one. He went out on a live mic, a hot mic, and he went off, and that was the end of that. But Goldust was born under Vince McMahon. Okay, None of them ever been world champions. Cody wanted to win it for his dad, Dusty Rhodes, who had passed away in, the, in, in recent years. He wanted to do it for his family. He wanted to do it for himself. He was denied a year ago. He was screwed out of the championship by the interference of the bloodline of Solo Sokoa. He wins the Royal Rumble. He earns the opportunity to fight for the world title again against Roman Reigns, who's still the champ. 1,300 and counting days at that point in time. Here comes The Rock, the biggest star on the planet, the biggest WrestleMania main event of all time, the biggest star in WWE, Roman Reigns versus the biggest star on planet Earth, The Rock. The stage is set. The fans revolt. And frankly, I was with them. I just told you The Rock might be my favorite wrestler of all time, but you don't just get to disappear for a decade, come back and walk right into the main event. I don't care if you're on the board of TKO which has bought WWE, by the way. I don't care if you're the bosses, if you're the boss of these WWE wrestlers. You don't just get to do that. The fans revolted. The video of The Rock and Roman Reigns coming face-to-face -face on SmackDown, the last I looked had half a million dislikes, and it was counting at that time. I quit looking. The most disliked video in WWE history because fans started the hashtag for five days straight. It trended on Twitter. We want Cody. So Cody... In storyline, I know it's predetermined, so is your TV show that you like to watch, as I like to point out. So are the movies that you watch, most of them, okay? I would just argue WWE is really, really entertaining compared to some things on TV. Cody has the right to be in the WrestleMania main event because he won the Royal Rumble again. Cody says, I'm going to be in the main event. The Rock gets mad. Roman Reigns gets mad. Then there is this other guy who's another champion named Seth Rollins. And they all four don't like each other. Long story short, they end up in a tag match on Saturday night, night one of WrestleMania, because it's now a two-night event. If Cody and Seth Rollins win, it's Cody versus Roman Reigns clean. Nobody can interfere. If The Rock and Roman Reigns win, it's bloodline rules, which means there's no rules. Anything can happen. No DQ. The bloodline and every single member can interfere in that match, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. The Rock, night one of WrestleMania, in the biggest tag team match of all time, pins Rody Reigns. Rody Reigns. Oh my gosh. Cody Rhodes. Why did I butcher that? Right in the middle of the ring. One, two, three. Which means anything goes in night two. And I couldn't have been happier. I wasn't rooting for Roman Reigns and The Rock. I was rooting for chaos. And the minute anything and anyone could get involved, my mind went crazy. I'm like, oh, I want to see Steve Austin come down. Because you know the whole entire bloodline is going to interfere. From Jimmy Uso to Solo Sokoa again to The Rock's going to come down. Well, Cody Rhodes has to have people to have his back in storyline. So who's it going to be? So the next night, night two of WrestleMania, will Cody Rhodes finish the story? Because if he doesn't, he's completely killed off as a character. You don't get no third chance. It's a baseball. You don't get three strikes and out. You get the rematch, which was bigger than the original match. In large part, due to The Rock being involved, let's be honest. What was going to happen? It was a regular great old wrestling match. I don't know, 15 minutes. All of a sudden, here comes Jimmy Uso of the bloodline. Right as Cody looks like he's about to finish off Roman, bam, super kick to the face of Cody. Here comes, remember, I said his twin brother Jay was no longer in the bloodline. And Jimmy and Jay had been feuding, had a match at WrestleMania. Jay won it. Jay comes down, boom, takes out Jimmy. The Usos are out. All right, next up, you know it's Solo Sokoa. Solo Sokoa. Here he comes. And they do the same exact spot as they did in the WrestleMania the year before. Solo's finishing move is the Samoan Spike. 
He spikes him the same time as Roman Reigns spears Cody Rhodes, which is Roman Reigns' finishing move. Cody Rhodes kicks out, unlike last year. Bam, here comes John Cena. The fans go crazy. Now, Solo had beaten John Cena at SummerSlam. Here comes John Cena, takes out Solo Sokoa, and here comes The Rock, and he's pissed. He's the board member. He's the final boss. Gets in Cena's face, which is a throwback to two or three previous WrestleManias, and then he rock bottoms John Cena. He pulls out his belt. He's getting ready to whip Cody Rhodes. The gong hits. Now, I was, I was looking for the glass to shatter with Austin, especially with all the history between Austin and The Rock, but the gong hits, and it's The Undertaker. The lights go out. The lights come back on. He choke slams The Rock straight to hell, as they would say, and it's back to Cody Rhodes, Roman Reigns, one-on-one, -on -one, and Cody Rhodes hits his finishing move, the crossroads, not once, not twice, but three times, pins Roman Reigns, and I should note this. This is a cooler part about professional wrestling. Roman Reigns, as he was being pinned, noticeably for a split second, had a huge smile on his face. A lot of people got emotional as soon as Cody Rhodes won. This is a guy that went away and started a complete new company because he was so mad at WWE. That company is called AEW. Comes back to WWE. There was the ring announcer could barely announce him as the winner because her voice was cracking. She was so emotional, Samantha. You had Michael Cole who was in tears. You had the fans going crazy. You had true emotion from people around the ring. We know it's predetermined. We know it's a storyline. But when done right, pro wrestling is more entertaining than 99% of the things you will watch on TV for free or pay to go see at a movie. When done right. For a decade or two, it had not been done right. But WrestleMania... Night two, WrestleMania 40, most fun I've had watching pro wrestling in a long time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, check out Jacobson Seed at the Jacobson Seed Company, jacobsonseed.com. And until next time, have a phenomenal day.